playing Resident Evil 4 for the first time is one of those experiences you never forget. It leaves your pupils dilated and your mind in a state of disturbed elation, like losing your virginity during a school shooting. Its impact on the gaming industry can be denied either. That slot has slipped around so much you'll find its DNA inside most third-person shooters since its release. But if RE4 is a bastard father to numerous children, the inbreeding it's done within its own series would earn it a stepbro tag on Pornhub. After remaking Resident Evil 2 and 3 in its image, it was only natural that Capcom would want to cash in on Resident Evil 4. But seeing as it RE4 isn't in that dire need of a tool-up since all the remakes did is make the old Resident Evil games play more like it, Capcom seems to have landed on the idea of why not just reimagine Resident Evil 4 by transplanting the plot and setting into a new game and call it something else, like Village. Because the Ville in Village sort of looks like the Roman numeral 8 if you've been inhaling enough carbon monoxide. It was cute when you pulled that graphic design trick with Resident Evil 7, but how are you going to keep that naming convention going for RE9? Title it Resident Evil Exited, it won't be long before I inevitably end up sinning remakes of games I've already sinned, but I'm willing to be the old man yelling at a remake of a cloud. The only enthusiasm I can find for a possible Resident Evil 4 remake is if it somehow unmakes RE5 and 6. But after Village, if Capcom has an actual Resident Evil 4 remake cooking somewhere, as rumors suggest, I think the devs might be a bit pissed off that they were the follow-up act to a game that borrowed every single idea from it. The similarities are not even hard to spot. A man is forced to search a decrepit village in somewhere Europe with a castle looming over it for a missing girl abducted by an evil cult. They've swapped out the annoying teenager for an infant, replaced the villagers who spoke Mexican Spanish with American English, and instead of a tiny Spanish man living in the castle who dresses like Napoleon, they have a giant lady who sounds like she'd be right at home voicing a character in Red Dead Redemption 2. I think my major gripe isn't that I didn't enjoy Village. I did. It's that I wanted more of what I enjoyed about Resident Evil 7. Resident Evil as a series is about as fresh as the mouse sore on a crack addict, but RE7 had the look and feel of one who was cleaning up their act and had stayed sober for a year, and then Village showed up one day with the shakes and glassy eyeballs of someone going through severe withdrawal. Resident Evil's reinventions of itself are about as sincere as posting self-help quotes to your Facebook page, and they tend to come in cycles. The first game proves a blazing success and invigorates a tired franchise. The second game worryingly starts to go off the rails as it tries to appeal to an ever broader audience. And finally, the third game jumps the shark. Sometimes even literally jumping a shark as you slide down an underground water slide. That actually happened in RE6. Long ago, a young girl went with her mother to pick berries for her father, who was hard at work. Supposedly, Village started life as a new entry into the Resident Evil Revelation series, which might explain the weird vestigial organs all over the place, such as the animated storybook opening. Because Revelation's games always tied themselves to some literary work, but what stands out more than that would be the enemies, who are supposed to be the result of the mold from the previous game. But when you're dealing with vampires and werewolves, my first thought isn't going to the black stuff under my sink as the culprit. Even the evil lady main villain is basically trying to do what the evil lady main villain in Resident Evil Revelations 2 was attempting. It all feels like it was quickly rewritten to include elements of Resident Evil 7. Gifts we gave. But more you took, she snarled. So more in turn is due. In a blink, the girl was trapped inside a mirror. Considering that this Mia is an imposter, I have to wonder why she wasn't weirded out that a children's book managed to predict her entire operation. And why wouldn't she be concerned over the ending where the child's father wins out over the witch? Capcom is so dedicated to keeping Ethan's face hidden that the family photo album doesn't even have any pictures of him. I don't know how they managed to miss hitting Ethan during all this. Chris's assault team was firing from multiple angles in the dark at Mia, and Ethan was right next to her at the table. Chris? What the hell? Sorry, Ethan. No! What? Why? Ethan's reactions come off about as sincere as the YouTubers let's play in this game and reacting to the same thing. I found myself waiting for him to remind me to like and subscribe, and then try to sell me on Raid Shadow Legends. Rose? What the hell are you doing with my daughter? Package secure, sir. Take him away. I said get your hands off her! Ethan, no. Maybe I'm expecting too much from a man who has gotten every team he's led killed, but Chris's ability to make things clear couldn't be on more display when he shoots Mia dead right in front of Ethan, and then instead of offering an explanation for this baffling action, just claims Ethan wouldn't understand, and then one of his men clocks Ethan in the head. Chris placed Ethan along with Mia's body and their baby all in the same transport, so that when it crashed, everything could go spectacularly wrong in a very predictable way. It sure was fortunate that Ethan was having dinner tonight in his outdoor winter hiking gear while wearing a clip-on flashlight. The BSAA transport truck just happened to drive right by the village where Miranda lived and where she planned to bring Rose to anyway. How do you miss with a shotgun at point-blank range while camping a doorway? Ethan was pulled under the floor similarly to how the old man was pulled into the ceiling. But instead of immediately killing him like the old guy, the lichen lets Ethan wander around in the crawlspace for a bit. 
Ethan will still be able to use 200 guns, even with his hand bitten in half. A lichen tossed Ethan out of the basement through the floor and out the front door. Yet there's no hole in the floor where Ethan was pulled under or just now tossed out of. Since everyone recalls the opening moments of Resident Evil 4, where Leon is chased to the village by a mob while desperately blocking doors with bookshelves until they all suddenly leave once they hear a church bell ringing. So Resident Evil Village has to do that too. I almost expected Ethan to wonder if everyone was going to play bingo. I'm not sure why the village is suddenly on fire after the attack. It's you, the child's father. I know this may have originally been a Revelations game, but maybe Capcom forgot they already used the Baba Yaga influenced character in Revelations too. Hey, wait. Do you mean Rose? Is she here? <laughs> Rose! Rose! Yes. She is in great danger. Since Mother Miranda brought her to the village, we have fallen into darkness. Ethan never once questions why everyone in this village knows who he is, or why they would want his daughter. Even weirder, he doesn't question why his dead wife's body wasn't present at the crash that put them here. Have you seen any other survivors? No. They're all in Louise's house. And she's not answering and the gate is locked. Quiet girl. He's an outsider. Is an outsider really less trustworthy than all your former neighbors who've turned into lichens? Even insular religious communities have a breaking point during a crisis. Outsiders, you're gonna get us all killed! Right. Anton! He helped Leonardo and Elena. We were doing fine by ourselves. In the past, these people must have had their own language and traditions. Then one day, they all became American. The old man Leonardo starts transforming into a lichen, presumably because he was bit by one. But Ethan was bitten as well and never transforms. And later, it's revealed that the lichens are created by implanting a Cadeau parasite into them. So when exactly was this guy implanted with that? Ramming the truck through the garage door directly behind it would have been preferable to ramming it into a wall and then using the truck as a staircase to the second floor. Ethan got an entire house full of people killed. And all of this was so he could get his hands on a screwdriver used once to open a latch for the key so he could probably progress to the castle. Ethan just smacked his half-eaten hand against the wall in anger. That should have hurt like hell. <laughs> Resident Evil 7 was pretty abusive to Ethan, but this game treats him like a kitchen knife holder. Heisenberg can control metal, but he doesn't remove Ethan's guns after capturing him alive. After being captured by Heisenberg, it's time for Ethan to meet all the bosses of the game exactly as he did with the Bakers in a big family meeting. And I have to say, I like the Bakers a whole hell of a lot more. And yes, that includes more than the MILF vampire everyone lost their collective pants over. The Bakers were just a normal family twisted by something they had no understanding of and still look mostly normal except unwashed and on meth. Absurd villains like this was something that worked in RE4 because Leon dealt with them by quipping right back at them. Villains set the tone for what kind of story it will be, and the hero is often a reflection of them. In Ethan's case, RTX reflections are turned all the way off because no matter how absurd the situation Ethan's in, he confronts it with the same seriousness as an accountant doing the mob's taxes. And now let the games begin! Why bother taking Ethan prisoner if you think he's dangerous to then immediately Thunderdome him? Do the Lycans really care that much about entertainment? Call me the Duke. Now to business. Weapons, ammunition, healing salves, anything you desire, I can provide. In yet another sin, I have to begin with the phrase, like in Resident Evil 4. Village has its own merchant, who I think must have been inspired by Morshu from the CDI Zelda games, who inexplicably appears in places that should be rather hard for him to reach. Also, he can buy and sell to one customer in a currency that is only accepted in this one tiny village. It was a silly idea in RE4, and it only worked because it was a silly game and he had nothing to do with the plot. The stranger was just there. He never offered Leon advice or explained the plot to him, whereas the Duke acts almost like a guide for Ethan for the rest of the game. And despite having more of a character, he's far less memorable than the stranger. I doubt any one will still be quoting him years from now when the game gets brought up on message boards. About the only positive difference I can mention is that unlike the stranger, Duke will sell Ethan ammo for the guns he buys from him. Once Ethan gets inside the castle, he's captured by Lady Dimitrescu's three daughters who drag him before their mother. This makes the third time Ethan has been captured, and I'm only on hour two. And they also don't bother disarming Ethan before they string him up. Escaping this would really suck for you, but no one who wants to keep someone restrained would trust putting hooks through a man's hands would keep him there. It's pretty obvious how to escape from it. They really need to come up with a better solution to the stalker enemy. Every time they build up a tense moment with an unkillable monster right on your heels, it's ruined the second I find a safe room it can't enter, and they just end up staring at me from a few feet away before turning around and leaving. Scary monsters aren't supposed to be like the creepy guy at the mall who can't follow you into the women's restroom. All this for a child who isn't here. That ends up being a lie. Well, a partial lie, since Ethan's daughter is partial herself right now. If you had the drop on Ethan, you could have cut his head off instead of his hand. 
Ethan grunts in pain when he picks up his severed limb like he was capable of feeling pain in that hand. To the game's credit, it does offer an explanation later for how Ethan can reattach his limbs like this, but Ethan isn't aware of the truth about himself yet, so he just assumes this is how wounds heal. Also, his sleeve is mended along with his hand. Since weapons are useless against Lady Dimitres, the only way to make her vulnerable is with a one-of-a-kind poison dagger that Ethan wasn't even aware of or searching for that he finds in a casket. <laughs> Ethan has been naturally selected to disguise himself in a trauma ward. Why do you always have to do this to yourself, Resident Evil? You spend so much creativity and marketing to get people interested in an intriguing villain with a great design, only to have them turn into a pile of roast beef and fingernails every single time. The same thing happened in RE7 with Jack, who was actually incredibly unnerving as a super-powered conservative voter with psychotic tendencies. Then by the end, he became the stuff you pull out of a clogged drain. All interest in the villain evaporates the moment they transform into a wall of meat. How can a man be almost dead? That's a question for the wise. That's a cryptic hint at Ethan's true nature. But if this old lady, who is actually Mother Miranda, is aware of that, then she shouldn't be too surprised Ethan survives her surprise attack near the end of the game. Will you please stop talking in riddles? I just want to find my daughter. It's only a riddle if you don't know the answer. That's the kind of remark I expect to see someone post on their Facebook page in all caps. Why, you have your daughter right in your own hands. What are you saying? Take a closer look. I'm not even going to try to make sense of the logic that you can divide a baby into four pieces and somehow revive it. However, I am going to question why the Duke, who seems to be aware of what happened to Rose and everything going on in the village, didn't tell Ethan about this and let him explore the castle at his own peril. First, you must use that key and collect all of your little Rose's flasks. Where are the rest of them? There are four in total. You have the one, and the other lords have the rest. The only reason Miranda would have for giving the flask to the lords is because she wanted them dead, and she wanted to use Ethan to do it. But three of them are fiercely loyal to her, and the fourth, Heisenberg, was too afraid to make a move. Nor could she have planned for this. She was only after Rose. Ethan ending up in the village was all circumstance. The third is Moreau, a being of twisted flesh that lives in the reservoir past the windmills. I'm no high school English lit teacher who will ignore multiple names being lifted from literary and biblical characters in an effort to assign more depth to your own work. Was naming Ethan's daughter Rosemary not enough so you had to pull from the aisle of Dr. Moreau? And to top that off, Miranda's original daughter was named Eva, which is just another way of saying Eve. The start of the only horror section of the game begins with what I felt to be a very Silent Hill style puzzle, which has Ethan inserting a family photo into a mail slot to open the door. I have no idea why Ethan was carrying around a full-size photo of his wife and child when he was captured instead of a more convenient wall size photo. Donna Beneviento's house is the best section of the game, being that it's the only section that tries to be survival horror. There's no combat since it takes Ethan's weapons away, and you're chased by a giant screaming baby that anyone who's ever cared for an infant will find more stressful than any of the meat blobs a boss has become. Even the boss fight against Donna and her dolls maintains this since unlike the others, she doesn't transform into a teratoma. Though I would like to point out the irony of a survival horror game having only a short standout moment of horror when that should be spread across the entire game. I never figured out if Angie somehow took all of Ethan's weapons from him in the dark without him noticing or used hallucinations to make him believe he had. Because after killing Donna, all of Ethan's guns are back in his inventory without ever picking them back up. So if she was capable of doing that, I think she should have also made him forget he had picked up a pair of scissors downstairs, since that's what he kills her with. Donna kept that key inside her chest. I'll just be taking this. What? 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 What are you doing with Mother's special child? For once, Ethan got a break. He grabbed the third flask without Moreau even being aware of it, and could have snuck out. Instead, he waited and got Moreau's attention so he could taunt him with it. So everything that happens afterward was an avoidable consequence, because Ethan should know by now that none of these people are normal and you shouldn't take them for granted. Ethan! I gotta say, I'm surprised you made it this far. It'd be a shame if something happened to you now. You would think Chris would be relieved that Ethan is alive. Instead, he continues to play it cold and throw suspicion on his actions for no real reason. You stay out of our business, Ethan stated at the beginning that Chris had put him through military training so he could defend his family in the event that they were attacked again. And now here they are being attacked again. It more than meets the requirements. Just because you named him Moreau doesn't mean you had to replicate Marlon Brando's performance. It would be helpful if Moreau were understandable to those not playing with subtitles on. There's no shortage of nonsensical puzzles in the game I could have sinned, but I think the Reservoir Puzzle, where meter-link sections of the catwalk are each raised on a timer by their own separate switch, is the most deserving of a Moon Logic Award. Must have been some legacy Eastern Block technology. You're better off than I thought. 
Who's that? Oh, come on. We just met a while back, not that it really matters. I'd love to learn the trick. Villains use a no when someone is standing next to a TV so they can broadcast a message to it. Also, since when have televisions come with a microphone so you can have two-way conversations? I don't normally sin games for allowing the main character to carry a large inventory, but I have to take exception when the game has him carry something impossibly heavy, like the stone altar containing the rose flasks, or the boat anchor of a hammer the giant lichen uses. Shut this fucking hole! Sir. Take a seat. Well, you just gave away how this cutscene is going to end. Don't you get it? It's a test. To see if you're strong enough to be a part of Miranda's spell. I the game never does offer a convincing conclusion on why Miranda gave the flask to her subordinates. She certainly wasn't planning on making Ethan a part of her family. But I'm next in line, right? Kill me, move up the chain. Having already placed all of his daughter's flask into the altar, Ethan didn't even need to come here to hear Heisenberg out. It's actually kind of bizarre that he would go through all the trouble of getting Rose's pieces and then leave them out in the open unguarded. Somehow Capcom even managed to work in the factory setting from Resident Evil 4. And like Leon, Ethan has the luckiest landing possible in a scrap metal pile. On top of werewolves and vampires, the game starts throwing cyborgs at you. Be honest, had they shown any of this cyborg stuff in the trailers instead of the giant MILF, you would have been more than a little concerned. That sure is a lot of people being processed in this factory. Way more than could have lived in this tiny village. Come to think of it, who's running all the processes of this factory? The Lycans don't seem intelligent enough to create cyborgs and run heavy machinery. Ethan can pick up these forged items that were just poured into a mold and not suffer the third degree burns you would expect. Since Heisenberg's power is magnetism, couldn't he just pull the gun out of Ethan's hands? I told you to leave it alone, Ethan. In the way. It should be obvious to Chris by this point that Ethan has been pulled into this whether he wants him here or not. And if he isn't going to get him to safety, he should stop telling Ethan to stay out of it. What do you care, Chris? You killed my wife, you son of a bitch! You think I killed Mia? That wasn't her. It was Miranda. Was that so hard? You could have told Ethan that on either of the two times you've spoken with him. She changed her appearance and pretended to be Mia. Seems she also survived being shot, so now I'm here to finish the job. So Chris managed to get the drop on the villain before she carried out her plan for once. The only thing he had to do after that is figure that B.O.W.s don't go down so easy based off his years of experience, and then not have his men drive Miranda right past her base of operations in the same truck that was transporting Ethan and Rose. Why don't you fucking tell me right away? Because I knew you would want to be involved. You can't use the lying to protect you excuse when you shoot a man's wife in front of him and take his daughter. Miranda's fucking insane. In this village, all these monsters and freaks, this is her life's work. Some sort of crazy experiment with the mold. In what has to be the world's most cursed coincidence, Chris had Ethan and Mia relocate to somewhere Europe, which was within driving distance of Miranda and the mold's origin. Rose. Holy shit, we gotta go! Maybe it wasn't such a great idea to collect the flask, place them in an altar specifically made for them, and then leave them completely unguarded. Metal polymer composite, huh? Chris found one of Heisenberg's old creations and got it working. A bulldozer with a chainsaw and a cannon. And for some strange reason, Heisenberg made it completely out of metal polymer composite, which his magnetism can't control. Which leads to the question, why would he make something that is immune to his very broken power? It takes a while for Capcom to embrace the memes that spring up around their games. Revelations 2 couldn't stop quoting cheesy lines from the first game. It won't be too many more games before we have Chris trying to hook Leon up with his sister. The game specifically mentioned Heisenberg's power couldn't affect Metal Polymer, yet the battle tractor is pulled into the air by it regardless. It shouldn't come as too much of a surprise that just like in RE7, the old lady Ethan would stumble across from time to time was the true mastermind behind it all. Calm yourself. Rose will be safe. The Mega My Seat catalogs all of us. However, she will be reborn as my daughter. Miranda can have her motivation for turning an entire village into monsters, kidnapping Ethan's daughter, and even inspiring the creation of the Umbrella Company decades ago summed up with, she wants her dead daughter back. Christ, did her brain or her womb rot first? Someone should have told her that she could have had another kid after the first one died. Historically speaking, a peasant woman living around the turn of the 20th century should have had around four or five kids by her 21st birthday. And this poor woman living in a rural village in the middle of somewhere Europe was apparently the world's first and foremost genetics researcher. Since she set about performing a century of inhumane experiments on her neighbors, with the big fungus she just happened to stumble upon in the hopes that one day it would be able to recreate her daughter through the stored memories in the Mega My Seat. I'm not even sure why Ethan and Mia's baby is the perfect candidate. Miranda just says it is. If it's because they were both infected by the mold, then we're back to square one of asking why didn't she just get herself knocked up again since she was infected with it too. I have to tip my imaginary fedora in Resident Evil Village. Somehow I managed to make a cult kidnapping the president's daughter to infect her with a mind control parasite sound plausible. The last time, 
I was able to contact Ethan. I heard Miranda's voice. She murdered him. Honestly, for the amount of successes versus team and VIP deaths, Chris has a garbage record. Since when does Chris Redfield smoke? Yesterday, we took down the transformed Miranda. But we didn't kill her. Who knew she could fake being a corpse? Considering that Miranda can shapeshift and perfectly mimic other people, how did Chris even learn she had taken Mia's place inside Ethan's home? Why does Chris have the same photo of the dead Mia that Donna had in her house? Well, I guess this question should be the other way around, since Chris would have taken a photo of the body, but Donna used the same photo of Mia in her doll puzzle, which was also possibly just an hallucination in Ethan's head. Yet somehow Ethan hallucinated the exact photo that he never saw that exists in reality. Shouldn't all the BSAA guys, including Chris, be wearing full body coverings and gas masks like they were back at the end of Resident Evil 7? They're dealing with an infectious mold after all. I was going to send this part for destroying the atmosphere by turning the game into a military shooter. But then I realized it illustrates something I've always believed. That being that bioweapons are a stupid idea. Chris wipes the floor with them. Turns out that a gun that kills what you're aiming at is a much better solution than indiscriminate viruses and molds. Which makes the premise of the entire franchise effectively worthless. Since why would everyone be trying to get their hands on this stuff if it is completely outclassed by normal soldiers? Chris isn't wearing any headwear unlike his teammates. Despite that he somehow has night vision goggles on in dark rooms. All of the important information is in the middle of all four of these books. Mia has only been in two Resident Evil games, and so far her role in both has primarily been to be held captive by mold people. Why are you here? I was caught. Houston experiments. If Miranda captured Mia and used her in experiments before assuming her place in the house, wouldn't Ethan have noticed his wife's absence? It takes more than a few hours to perform lab experiments. You said that you would keep us safe. We did everything that you asked. We moved over here everything! The fact that they relocated right next to the origin of the mold still gets me, so I'm sending it a second time. I tried to keep this a secret, but... You don't understand how special he is. Is it too late to give the vaccine to Zoe instead of Mia? Keeping secrets is what got Ethan involved in this in the first place. And if Mia knew Ethan had been changed by the mold back at the Bakers, why keep it hidden from him? She even had a child with him, knowing full well her baby couldn't be normal either. I don't think Ethan ever passed high school biology if he didn't know that wasn't how wounds heal. Three years ago, the Baker House, you were murdered by Jack. I'm detecting a rather poorly inserted retcon here. You expect me to believe that Capcom started setting this up back in Resident Evil 7 when Jack curb stomped Ethan in the guest house, and somehow the mold revived him while being dragged to the house, turning his whole body into mold in the process that apparently mimics being human so well that even subsequent medical evaluations afterward didn't detect it. And when people infected by the mold take too much damage, they calcify and crumble to dust. Something Ethan didn't do even after having his heart ripped out. And if Ethan was a molded for that entire game, Evelyn should have had complete control over him since it was her mold. Duke brought Ethan to the ritual side in his carriage despite the path here being blocked by mold. And despite just steering the carriage from the front seat, he's sitting at the back when Ethan gets out. What? <laughs> My power is leaving me! Miranda did all this to try and resurrect her own daughter who died during the Spanish flu. But as soon as Rose emerges from the mold, she apparently, as an infant, knows who the bad guy is and the situation and weakens Miranda's power. Get her now! Maybe shoot her a few more times, Chris. Or how about you use that laser to call in more bombs on her? He does nothing more to help Ethan during the fight. Miranda's final form even ends up looking a lot like Sadler's from the end of Resident Evil 4. Ethan goes through more hands in a Skywalker. Watch over her. Teach her to be strong. Is this not bringing up any traumatic memories for you, Chris? Piers made the same sacrifice back in RE6. Forget the bioweapons. Are there any regulations on the books restricting the handheld bomb Chris has that goes off with the yield of a backpack nuke? Captain, you need to see this. You better come have a look at this sequel bait, sir. BSAA didn't send soldiers. This is a bioweapon. It's just as I keep saying, any organization tasked with protecting the world will inevitably turn out to be evil in the end. Standard flying off into the sunrise Resident Evil ending cliché. An unknown amount of years later and Rose is on the bus on her way to visit Ethan's grave while reading the storybook from the beginning of the game. I'm not sure why she has such an attachment to that particular book. After all, that was the book that Miranda, the woman who killed her dad, brought and read to her. Ethan didn't even like it and thought it was too scary for a kid. So if this is years later, what happened with that whole BSAA using bioweapons entry the game just set up? You're a lot like him, you know? And how would you know that? Guy we've never seen before and who likely never even met Ethan? I know. And how would Rose know? She was a baby when Ethan died. 